As little children in Mashiach, Christ, we ought to be the experts on life. We ought to find the most joy in it, care for it, revel in it, make real-life sacrifices for it, because it is sacred. Yet as is so many cases for those who call themselves the Church, the reality is far different. Some would say even the opposite, for what was founded on life and the intricate care for it and the perfect cause of life and the ultimate sacrifice for it has turned into a body which thoroughly rejects it. We have become the friends of death. I say this because of the near total embrace of anti-fertility practices, namely contraception by the Kala, the bride of Christ herself. Not everyone knows it, but this rejection of children and war against fertility is a new embrace by the Church. From the onset and at the earliest documented time, the Church Fathers rejected contraception and strictly prohibited it as immoral. To use contraception was to treat one's wife like a whore. You can find it prohibited down through the centuries as immoral and even prohibited by the major Protestant groups for the first 400 years of Protestantism. It was not until 1930, in fact, at the Lambeth Conference in England, that any church ever officially found a reason that contraception might be acceptable. This was the Anglican Church, and without even reading much more on the subject, anyone with common sense can pretty much guess what followed and the Church has continued further down the path, endorsed more reasons why contraception might be acceptable, and eventually all large bodies except the Roman Catholic Church accepted contraception. The purpose of this page at Kodesh Kala, then, in the Holiness of the Bride, is to provide you some resources to show why Church doctrine has always been correct, and why this war on fertility through contraception is sinful and destructive. I can only pray that it offers enough to at least encourage, provoke, inspire a few who use contraception to leave it be behind forever. I also pray for a true turnaround in the body of Messiah. I pray we accept the gift of children which our Father gives us and end this rejection of life. The Lord has called us His body and we are making it sterile. The use of contraception, after all, violates biblical principles. It violates natural law at the very minimum in medicating a healthy person, and it furthermore replaces a full and fruitful love that a husband and wife are to have with each other, with an arrangement to use one another, a use well below our human dignity, much less the love of our Savior. Not only that, but the introduction of contraception into our culture was a true weapon of destruction in the amount that it facilitated evil and death. Contraception helped increase promiscuity, adultery, divorce, and abortion. And when you come to really think about it, that kind of makes sense. What you're doing when you tell people they can contracept easily and without shame is that the act of intercourse is one without consequences. A terrible illusion, if there ever was one. How do you expect those millions of souls so convinced to act? Moreover, the war against fertility is most clearly a war against life in the link we see between contraception and abortion. Let's not stop and argue here, it would be fruitless. If an entire nation believes that a child is a problem, something to be avoided at sometimes great costs, will that same nation desire those children when they finally come along? I don't think so. It is true that there are people who would seek to destroy fertility and would also refuse to have an abortion, but there are millions more who once swayed that a child was a mistake, an error, something like a disease, would follow through with that attitude and eradicate the child which God gave them. Contraception not only helped to increase abortion rates in our nation, but also helped to facilitate abortion's legalization in 1973. In fact, the very same reasoning about the right to privacy that was used in legalizing child murder had been used less than ten years earlier in legalizing its predecessor contraception. These two monsters are both logical and legal partners. If that weren't nightmarish enough, this love affair, which the bride is having with contraception, is manifested most darkly in the fact that the most popular kinds of contraception are abortifacient in nature. They are designed not only to avoid the fertilization of the egg, but also to thin the lining of the uterus so that the child of only a few days or a few weeks 
simply starves to death in the presumed safety of his mother's womb. This is what the church is putting into its body. This is what the bride has been compulsively in love with for decades. Should we su be surprised at the state we're in? I can imagine a Christian pastor standing at the pulpit looking out over his flock, giving a sermon. He knows all the while that most of the females out there have turned their bodies into death factories. I imagine that bleak pastor looking over his flock as a man looking over his own hometown, which has been utterly destroyed by an enemy. I imagine him as a Japanese emperor Taisho as he looked out over a demolished Tokyo turned to rubble in 1923 by the earthquake and the fires that followed. I imagine him as the surviving child who stood atop a hill and gazed on an annihilated Warsaw, which the Nazis destroyed block by block in their retreat. And that pastor is to stand watch over his city, but the city has been turned nearly to dust. What does that man say or do? What can he say or do? The perpetrator is seated before him. Many people will burn hot at these comments, I know, but which comment above is not true? And if the comments above are true, then whom should we burn hot at? Shouldn't it be ourselves? Shouldn't it be the guilty party? And if we are guilty, we've got to stop. I only say all this to speak to the heart, and I sincerely pray for repentance in the church, a great repentance. My heart goes out to all those pro-lifers who desperately want to end the child killing that goes on legally in our nation, but I also weep for them because they are not going to make more than a small difference against abortion as long as our attitudes toward children and fertility stay the same. If we are a contracepted bride, we are a bride at war with life itself, at war with the gift the perfect God of life himself gave us. This is not a people which is going to end abortion. We would have made sure Messiah was never born at all. You know, however hard I make it sound here, the point of this homily is not to rub anyone's nose in it nor to discourage anyone in their faith. This homily and this whole page is to present the problem and also remind that there is a way out. That way is the union of the woman of the man and the man, a way so beautiful that the work of God's own son reflects the ancient Jewish wedding, a way so magnificent that the very union in marriage and children reflects the nature of God himself. In fact, the sacrifice of the Savior is so deeply rooted in truth that he gave himself in a model of the Jewish sacrifice at Passover, the table, the meal, the home, the Father, who is priest at the time of deliverance. God's very picture of salvation is also a picture of the way out of this wasteland we've let ourselves into. That is a picture of the home, of children, of sacrifice. These shall be the waters of life for us, and there shall be life from the dead. May the Lord God help us all, and may he bring us to repentance. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light has shined in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it.